Yesterday we talked about lines of charge and charge disks, but today instead of talking about a continuous distribution, I want to talk about something called a dipole. So dies too. You might have uh, be familiar with this from chemistry and biology. So physically, what is a dipole and what can we say about its electrical properties? Well, what a dipole is, just real quick, <clears throat> is two charges, positive and negative, separated by some distance d. And uh, that's it. So di means two, pole is like charge. So a monopole would just be a single point charge, technically. Uh, so we can ask a couple of questions. The first maybe is, what's so important about a dipole? Um, besides just appearing all over in nature, for example, water is a very important dipole, um, but it's not. If you look, water has a negative or a more electronegative uh, oxygen molecule and then two more positive hydrogen, um, well, protons really stuck to it. And that means that you have a negative and two positives. That's not a dipole. There are three there. But we approximate it as a dipole. And that's kind of the point. Dipoles are useful for approximation. There's something called the multipole expansion. What it means is that I can as approximate any arbitrary electric field as a combination of monopole, so point charges, dipole, and so on in powers of two, two. So I would get some coefficient times the monopole term plus the second coefficient times the dipole term. And then I could keep going in powers of two. So this is this means it's two to the zero power, so you get one. Two to the one is two. 2 to the 2 is 4, this is the quadrupole term, and so on, you would get, the next one would be 8, and then 16, and so on. So, you can do this expansion, and the truth is, is that you hardly ever even need the quadrupole term, and if, if you do, then you definitely, I mean, only very rarely do you ever see anyone use the octopole term. But almost always, you need the dipole term. And the combination of these two actually make a pretty good approximation for any arbitrary electric field, unless it's very complicated. And so that's the importance of the dipole physically, is that it appears as a term in an approximation expansion that can be done to make complicated fields uh, simple in their calculation. So, What's the next question we can ask about a dipole? Let me redraw it, positive and negative. It's good that it's easy to draw. Uh, one thing we can ask is, what does the electric field around a dipole look like? Remember, we have to go away from the positive charges and toward the negative charges. So in the middle, you get these lines that kind of bend out like this and are very strong. And then on the outside, you get loops away from the positive and towards the negative charge. And as you get further away, the loops get further, so it's not quite as strong. So instead of with a point charge, you just get everything either going out or coming in with positive or negative, you get this looping pattern. And that's what's so characteristic about the dipole and its interactions is these... Uh, um, fields that go in circles, or loops. Um, the next thing we can ask is a question about calculation. Well, we want to know if this is my x and y, or I'm sorry, let's say this is like an x and z axis, so that this distance here is d. So this is the distance between my dipole. This will be the positive and this will be the negative. Positive on top. I want to know what is the electric field a distance z away from the dipole but along its axis. 
By its axis, I mean the line that goes between the two charges. That is the, that's what we're going to call the axis of the dipole because it's symmetrical around that. I can rotate the dipole counterclockwise and clockwise and it doesn't change what the field is along the axis. I can't rotate it this way because then the field would be changing. The line of the axis is changing or this way. Um, so let's go ahead and try to answer that question. These are discrete charges so I don't have to do any integration. I don't have to do anything like we did yesterday. All I have to do for, to find the electric field is add the electric field of the positive charge and the electric field of the negative charge. So let's do that. The positive charge, I get positive Q over 4 pi epsilon naught. One thing I neglected to say earlier that is important is that these two charges have the same magnitude, even though they're opposite in sign. That, is, uh, that comes with the definition of a dipole. The two charges are always the same size, even if they're not the same sign. And then I get 1 over r squared. r here is this distance, the distance between the positive charge and my point z up here. So it'll be the total z from the origin minus this d over 2. So r is z minus d over 2 and I have to square it. That's r squared. So that's the positive. And then I have to add to it the field from the negative charge. So I get negative q over 4 pi epsilon naught and then 1 over r squared. r in this case is z plus d over 2. So I get z, I have to add to it d over 2 and square it. Okay. So let me go ahead and take out the constant term and we'll see what we want to do. So we get a Q over 4 pi epsilon naught out front and then I get maybe in parentheses this 1 over Z minus D over 2 squared and then this minus sign is right here 1 over Z plus D over 2 squared. Alright, what to do? Um, Let's form a common denominator and try to get this as a single fraction. So, these two multiply together. I get, uh, maybe I'll break this up. Denominator is going to be z minus d over 2 squared times z plus d over 2 squared. So this would be just to make it completely clear, z minus d over 2 times z plus d over 2, all of that squared, which is, this is uh, like a minus b times a plus b, so we get, uh, remind me, it's, yeah. What did I do here? Uh, I got ahead of myself. Let me backtrack a little bit. It will be easier so I can get the term that I want to have z in the denominator here because I'm going to compare the size of d to the size of z. And so it's, it, it would be useful for them to be in the same fraction. And so to do that, I need to pull out a z squared from both of these. Can I do that? Yep. So let me do that. I get q over 4 pi epsilon naught, 1 over z squared. And then here I get 1 minus d over 2z squared minus 1 over 1 plus d over 2z squared. So that's the term I wanted. That's where I messed up. And now we continue just like I was doing before. The denominator is going to be 1 minus d over 2z times 
times 1 plus d over 2z, all of that squared, which is, we get 1 minus d over 2z squared. That's why I wanted to take z out. This is much prettier, and I can't forget about this square. And that comes with a new numerator, starting back at the top. So there I have my denominator, and it will have numerator. I get this term, 1 plus d over 2z squared. Yeah, minus the other one, 1 minus d over 2z squared. Try to make sure I get this right. So I'm just going to expand these. I get 1 plus d over z plus, um, I don't want to put it in, in another set of parentheses, plus uh, d squared over 4z squared minus 1 minus d over z um, plus d squared over 4z squared. These terms are the same, so they get canceled in the subtraction, and these are the same. So I just end up with d over z minus negative d over z, which is 2d over z. So let me put, put this together. We now end up with the electric field is q over 4 pi epsilon naught. Can't forget the 1 over z squared. And then this fraction, 2d over z in the numerator, and then in the denominator, this 1 minus d over 2z squared, squared. All right, I can take out another z and the 2, or the 2d rather. So this means that e is um, qd over 2 pi epsilon naught, 1 over z cubed, and then I get this term, this 1 over 1 minus d over 2z squared squared. Yeah. Alright, so this is the exact solution. Uh, this will give you the exact field given some distance d and uh, height z on the dipole axis. But allow me to make a further approximation, or we haven't approximated anything yet. This is exact. Uh, let me make my first approximation. This is why I went back and fixed the term so that I would have d over 2z here in the denominator. Um, e is approximately if, so in the limit that c is much larger than d. And in practice, d is very small. Think, for example, on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters when you're talking about the distance between the proton and a hydrogen molecule and the nucleus of an oxygen molecule. So d is very small. And z can be uh, macroscopic distances even, or at least um, much larger on the scale of molecules or uh, dipoles that are in materials. So this is very often the case, and that's why it's useful. It's called the dipole approximation, if you want to look it up. In that case, this d over 2z is basically 0. So I get 1 minus a very small number squared, so it's even smaller than that. And then I get this a number that's almost 1, and I square it, so it's even closer to 1. So it's a very good approximation because you have two squares here. Um, and in that case, this entire term is 1. And then e is approximately qd over 2 pi epsilon naught 1 over z cubed. So this is the electric field around a dipole. Uh, either this to be exact or this one to uh, follow the dipole approximation. And I can define one more thing. 
if I take d to be the vector between the negative charge and the positive charge, so now d is this vector here, d squiggle, so it's a vector, then I can define the dipole moment which is given the term P, like momentum, but it, this, in this case it's the dipole moment, which is the charge, the magnitude of the charge, for the positive and negative, times the D vector that, um, I have to underscore this, this vector goes from the negative charge to the positive charge. It's always pointing at the positive charge. And so the dipole moment also points from the negative charge to the positive charge. That's important. If you get that wrong, all of your directions are going to be wrong. And so along the axis, I can actually write the E vector, so this is the axial field, as P over 2 pi epsilon naught, 1 over Z cubed. All right, so that's a dipole. And you should now be able to answer the first set of questions. There are two more things we need to talk about in the context of dipoles. Uh, the first is the torque that a dipole experiences when it's in an external uh, electric field. And the second is the potential energy that a dipole has in an electric field. So first, let's talk about torque. So why, why does a dipole experience torque in the first place? Imagine there's some external electric field, so I'm going to call it e, EXT, so external. And we have somewhere here a dipole. So for a dipole, what you do, you say the dipole is located here at that point because it's so small. And you, you draw an arrow to indicate its direction and you put p-vector. That indicates a dipole. So the dipole moment here. That kind of is the dipole. So, if this is so small, then the electric field in this region around the dipole is approximately constant. So I can redraw this as a constant electric field. Let's say it's going this way. So the electric field is going this way. And then my dipole here has a negative charge and a positive charge. Let's color code these. Uh, positive will be red, negative will be blue. The positive charge experiences a force in the direction of the electric field, so that's F positive. And the negative charge experiences a force in the opposite direction, so this will be F negative. Let me just connect them so it kind of looks like it's a barbell that's being twisted. So you can see here since the force is in opposite directions, the dipole will be pivoted around the center, its center point. And that's what causes the torque. So let's say, let's see what is the magnitude of that torque. The torque here is going to be F positive times, uh, let's say this is D over 2 for the lever arm. So we get D over 2, and if this is the angle theta, I get a sine theta here. And I have to add to that the torque from the negative charge. So we get F negative, we still get D over 2, and sine theta. So, if the charges are the same, well, let's just say um, the magnitude of F positive is equal to the magnitude of F negative. It's just going to be uh, Q, whatever the magnitude of the charge is, times the external electric field. So the magnitude of the torque, then, is going to be Q E external. Uh, let me rearrange the terms. You get Q 
D times E external times sine theta. And hopefully you recognize this as a cross product. You have here the dipole moment, Q times D, and the external field. So I can write the torque as the cross product of the dipole moment and the external field. So I write it this way as external, so you do not confuse it with the field of the dipole. Those are two separate things. I did not consider the field of the dipole when I did this calculation. The torque on the dipole is due only to the external field. This has to be, maybe you have some uh, lines of charge or sheets of charge in an area far away from the dipole, and it produces an external field that then produces a torque on the dipole. And notice that when the dipole is aligned with the external field, so let's say this is positive and this is negative, the positive charge experiences a force going this way, the negative charge experiences a force going this way, and they're equal in magnitude, so the net force is zero. So if you put a dipole in an electric field, it has a torque until it's aligned with the field. All right. Did I get everything? Yep. Here, you, you'll uh, notice one last thing, that P is in this direction, and that's the same as the direction of the external field. So the uh, the point is that the external field will tend to align the dipole moments uh, with itself, so that they're in the same direction. All right, the last thing we need to talk about in the context of dipoles are their potential energy when they're put in a field. So, uh, how should I go about this? I'm just going to write PE up here. How are we going to calculate the potential energy that the dipole has. Well, when it's not aligned to the electric field, we know it experiences a torque. And if it is aligned, it experiences no torque. So if it's aligned to the electric field, it's in equilibrium. And so there should be some work done by the electric field to bring it from a position where it is not in equilibrium to a position where it is in equilibrium. So let's calculate what that work is. Remember, the potential energy is going to be the negative of the work done on the um, dipole. And in the case of uh, these dipoles, they're being rotated. And so the work is the torque over an angle. It's a rotational, uh, rotational work. So I have to integrate the torque over the angle that it gets rotated. And so let me bring in what we just had. Uh, the potential energy is going to be minus, oh, I'm sorry, this is the work, so I get a minus sign here. Integral, the torque is the dipole moment times the external field times the sine of theta, v theta. Um, these two don't depend on theta, but the sine does. And so I can take it out, u is minus pe external integral sine theta d theta. The integral of sine is the cosine. I should have just done that all in one step. Uh, we get PE external cosine theta. Good. All right, well, just like you should have recognized the previous one as a cross product when it has the sine, now you have a cosine. What does this give you? A dot product. So I can write U is do I get a minus sign? Yeah. Minus dipole moment dotted with the external field. So torque is cross product. Potential energy is dot product with a minus sign. Pretty easy to remember. Remember, torque is a vector, so you need the vector product. And potential energy is a scalar, so you need the scalar product. Recall this is the angle between the two ve uh, vectors, right? This is the angle between the external field and the dipole moment. And that's why you get the cosine here.
the dot product gives you the angle between the two vectors. It's another way to say that. So let's look at what that means. Three cases. The first case, um, P is anti um, parallel to the external electric field. So let me draw what that is. The ele external electric field goes up. Can't have it be curved right now. Goes this way. That's the external. And the dipole is anti-parallel, so it goes the opposite direction. I'll draw it in red. We get the P going opposite the external electric field. So in that case, U is minus P dot E. So it is U of minus minus P E. So U is positive P times E. So here, U is positive. It is the max at its maximum uh, potential energy. Think about it this way. The dipole wants to be aligned to the external electric field. And so if it's exactly anti-aligned to the external electric field, it has the most potential to rotate and have work done upon it, or it has the most potential energy. The second case is uh, P is perpendicular to E. I don't know why I got these words in there. Ah, that's much more relaxing on the eyes. P is perpendicular to the external electric field. So let's see what happens. You get E, you get P. You should see what's coming. U is minus P dot E. They're perpendicular to each other, and so this is zero. It has no potential energy here. Or the potential energy is zero, but you can go below zero. In the third case, this is the minimum potential energy. Uh, we have P is exactly parallel to E. So we have E going this way, and P is right along with E. And in that case, U is minus P dot E, which is just minus P times E. So we have our maximum value of positive P times E when we're anti-aligned. And then we rotate through 0 to being negative P dot E when we're ex exactly aligned. So we go from a positive value to a negative value. If you look closely, you'll notice that this is a equilibrium position when the forces are the same on the positive and negative charge here. But it is an unstable equilibrium, and hence you have the maximum potential energy here. If it rotates this way or this way, either way, the potential energy is decreasing. And so this is an unstable equilibrium. Here is not, it is not an equilibrium. The potential energy is zero, um, and it will continue to rotate until it is aligned where the potential energy is a minimum, and this is a stable equilibrium. All right, that's it. Uh, that's really it for dipoles uh, as far as what you'll see in high school. If you continue um, in your undergraduate, you will see what the exact fields around a dipole are and how to deal with that in spherical coordinates. And um, in your graduate courses, you'll learn how to use this in the multipole, multipole expansion that I mentioned earlier. See its actual utility.